Hey everyone, and welcome back to Behind the Space Bar. This is episode 13, Why You Should Use Tracks. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. Glad you're here. Behind the Space Bar is a podcast for musicians, music directors, playback techs, really anyone performing on stage with Ableton Live. Uh, if this is not your first time and you're coming back uh, and you've been listening for a while, I have a favor to ask for you. Think of one person that you think would enjoy this podcast and just share it with them. Uh, shoot them a text, uh, share a link uh, from Apple Podcasts and say, hey, check out uh, Behind the Space Bar. I think we'd enjoy it. In fact, today's episode will be super helpful for someone, uh, maybe band members, um, fellow band members that you're trying to to transition to using tracks, you're thinking about using tracks, this episode's for them. Uh, last episode, episode 12, uh, uh, we caught it, Real Musicians Don't Use Tracks. And I, I tried to really answer um, uh, kind of that that pushback, that hesitancy a lot of people have about using tracks where they feel like maybe they're cheating. They feel like, uh, you know, real musicians don't use tracks. I, I tried to to fight back and, and fight back and combat the idea that using tracks is because uh, you use tracks because you're a lesser musician. And if you're a real musician, you don't use tracks. And I hope that episode was beneficial, helpful. Again, my intent in that was not to try to shame people that um, don't want to use tracks. If you don't want to use tracks, fine. That's great. That's okay. Um, but I was just hoping that we could walk away and say, listen, if you don't enjoy tracks, you don't want to use them, it doesn't make sense in your context, then great. In fact, I had uh, someone uh, comment on YouTube and talk about how they just play with a click. They don't use tracks. Their band's super full. They're happy. Again, that's great. That's fantastic. But I thought today's episode would make sense as a follow-up episode to last week's episode because we I, I kind of hope to debunk the idea that using tracks makes you a lesser musician or that you use tracks to cheat or that using tracks is cheating. I hope to debunk that and I thought, well, maybe I did this out of order. Maybe I should start with the whole idea of like why you should use tracks in the first place. So uh, that's today's episode. I just have a couple thoughts. I think this will be a quicker episode. Just a couple thoughts I wanted to share, um, but I would love to hear from you. Um, yes, this is a podcast. So if you're listening on Apple podcasts, there's really no place to do this. If you're watching on YouTube, um, uh, whether you're watching the premiere or watching the replay afterwards, uh, I, I would love for you to leave a comment. I would love to know why you use tracks. What's the, the biggest benefit to you? Just leave a comment. Um, I, I love seeing that. I love seeing comments from different people, different uh, sources. I love seeing comments from folks that are doing this with their cover band, folks that are doing this as solo artists, folks that are doing this as worship leaders uh, in churches. I love seeing comments from different types of people that are um, using tracks for all sorts of different reasons. But I thought it would be a good episode today just to talk. Um, uh, really, I, I wrote down three things. That's, that's all I got for today, uh, just to talk about why you should use tracks, why it'd be beneficial. So let's dive into it. I've talked for way too long. Let's get to it. So I think the number one reason for me, uh, this is at least been my personal experience for using tracks is to supplement your sound. Now, I want to say, uh, you know, when I worked for a, a church resource company and we would go to church conferences, uh, talking to worship leaders, and I would throw out this idea, often I would say something like, and I kind of hinted at this last week's episode, I would say something like, it'll fill out the sound of your band. It'll make your band sound full. And honestly, when I think about that and I look back at that, I'm like, that's kind of a stupid thing because, um, I mean, you don't want something to sound empty. Um, you don't want it to sound like something's missing. I don't think anyone wants that. But fullness is not necessarily a goal I feel like we should go after because I've heard a lot of bands that are sound full. They've got a lot of instruments. They've got a couple keyboardists. They've got a couple guitarists. Uh, maybe they even have two drummers. But that the amount of musicians they have doesn't make them sound a uh, good sounding thing. Right. I hope that makes sense. I know I'm not articulating that. Well, it's too early in the morning. Uh, I guess I need to finish my coffee, but um, I think having a full sound is not the goal, but to supplement your sound, I think could be a goal. I often think of tracks as uh, just another instrument. I think of Ableton Live as an instrument. When I'm teaching people how to transition to tracks, I teach a framework called the 3T Transition Timeline. Um, and it's all about transitioning to tracks. And um, uh, one of the things I teach in that as a concept is that Ableton Live is an instrument. It's not just a computer that you throw tracks on and you press play and you don't really think about it. It really truly is an instrument. An instrument takes time to master. It takes time to learn. Um, uh, you'll spend a lifetime trying to master it, but hopefully you learn enough 
bits and pieces to get up to, to speed and start working quickly. Uh, that's what I attempt and try to do it from studio to stage and with free content like, like this, uh, podcasts and tutorials. Um, but it's an instrument. And so when I think about that as an instrument is what type of sounds that it can Ableton bring to the table. Now it depends on your context. It depends on, um, maybe you're bringing stems from this, the stage, uh, uh, from the studio to the stage. That sounds like a great name for a company. Um, and, and you're trying to represent that stuff. That's, that's one part of it. Maybe it's content you're creating on your own, or maybe it's for me the very first time, um, I used Ableton live for tracks. I think this is the first time I'd used tracks before this shows you how old I am. I'd used tracks before, but it was on a, a disc man, a CD player, not a Walkman. I'm not that old, but uh, a disc man CD player. And, um, when the, uh, drummer would start and doing four on the floor, the subs would actually rattle the stage and cause the tracks to skip. So we'd kill it. So yeah, the first time I used Ableton for tracks on stage was, uh, with a band I played with in college. And, um, the second year I've told the story before, but our second year, our percussionist left. And so we added just a little tambourine thing in, and we all went like, wow, our, our life had changed because it sounded, um, just adding a tambourine and just, just elevated the sound of, of the song of the band. And it was great. Um, I've worked in situations where adding uh, white noise filter sweeps, adding a four on the floor kick, um, uh, adding string sounds just supplements the sound of the band. So uh, you get to add new sounds that you can't create on stage. You you could create them on stage if you had six different keyboardists, if you had eight different guitar players. But if you use play to click, you're using tracks, you could add those sounds in. You The low moments the really emotional moments, um, you could add some really nice ambient sounds in the big moments. You could have some nice dynamic things happen in percussion elements uh, and things like drum loops that I guess you could, you know, I've seen drummers, um, that do like the, like jungle beat kind of thing, like super quick thing. I can't remember that one drummer and my buddy Doug used to always love, uh, that he would almost like play, I guess it was like a V drum kit or he would play like a real drum set and um and then mic it and then it would be affected through a soundboard i've seen people do that live and that's super cool but in general a washy drum loop the kind of like like that sort of thing you can't recreate live now you could say i can play that drum beat live on stage with drums that's great that's perfect you should do that but the filter thing the the kind of delayed thing the washy thing the the filter sweep of that um can't really be recreated live again you can mic a drum set and you could do it but not a single person in the audience i hate to tell you this i hate to burst your bubble but not a single person in the audience cares if you created it live versus it's in the tracks and you just play a solid beat on top of it but you could supplement your sound i think this is super cool because um you can um, uh, you know yes make your sound sound bigger but it, your band sound bigger but I, I think it's less than that it's uh it's more than that rather it's um it's adding new sounds sounds that you can't create with the instruments on stage and so the 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 band on stage plus treating ableton as an instrument gets you to create and supplement your sound in a really cool unique way okay number two because again i promise i don't want this to be a long episode we'll go about five or ten more minutes number two is fill in for missing musicians this is maybe a little more difficult to talk about because on one hand it's like Hey, should I uh, hire this person to to play this instrument? Oh no, I'll just pre-record them and we'll go on the road and basically use their content without having to pay them every week. That's a difficult comment. Like that's not a fun thing to say out loud. Like let's not say the truth out loud, right? Um, that that's that's not a great thing. But let's talk about a scenario where you don't have the budget to go pay a percussionist to travel on the road with you. You just you don't. There, there's no scenario unless the percussionist is going to make. Twenty dollars a day traveling with you, no per diem. Um, that 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 you could do it, right? You could call your buddy who's a percussionist and say, "Hey, can you come out on the road? Twenty dollars a day. I don't have money to give you per diem. You don't have a place to sleep. I guess you can like uh, you know sleep on the in the van while we're all in the hotel or whatever. Or, you know, maybe we don't have budget for a hotel. We're all sleeping in a van, but twenty dollars a day. That's it. Do you want to take it?" your buddy says no. So you say, well, instead of doing that, I can't afford to, to hire you. But what if I paid you, uh, $300, $500, a thousand dollars, whatever to come over to the studio, let's record some percussion parts and we'll take you on the road in that way. Again, this is a difficult thing to talk about. It's kind of, it's quickly turns into the, they took our jobs kind of mentality. If you know that reference. Um, so I don't want to go there with that, but from a perspective of, um, uh, again, adding new sounds from a perspective of um, 
just very practically, this is the point I'm trying to make with part two again. Sorry, it's really early. I need to finish. I'm like halfway through my coffee, my iced coffee here. I need to finish it. The point of this I'm trying to say is you're out on the road, you're doing a tour, um, your bass player gets sick. You know, I remember the days like pre COVID when you would have the flu. I remember doing an event at Sweetwater, interviewing a band where I had the flu, double ear infection, uh, snots coming out of every orifice you can imagine. And uh, I, you know, the show must go on, right? I flew all the way out to the booming metropolis of Fort Wayne, Indiana, and uh, you got to do your interview thing inside. In between takes, I would go wipe all the snot off my face and my eyes and go back out, put a smile on and do it. Uh, and, you know, that's how we used to be. And now with COVID happening uh, and post pandemic some would say still in the middle of the pandemic whatever your take is man i'm really gonna offend a lot of people with this episode uh whatever your feelings are on that now it's more of like hey you're not feeling great why don't you like isolate stay away from us don't like tough it out you know um uh, and try to do it so in that sort of sense you say all right our bass player is going to stay at the hotel going to isolate uh we're just going to unmute the bass parts and we're going to make it through and it's not ideal but it's better than having to cancel a concert right maybe you're in a situation where um, you are a drummer, you're a bassist, guitar player. Um, and when you, when you talk about your song from the, the, the record, you go from the studio, you had a lot of like, not necessarily piano parts, but a lot of pad parts, synth parts. Um, again, you don't have the budget to pay to bring someone on stage. Like, let's just say that's reality. You don't have the budget to do that, but you created all those parts in the studio. Why, who says you can't bring those parts with you on stage? Again, you could say it's cheating. Okay, if you feel that way, don't do it. But I guarantee you, again, unless you're going to, I said this last week, unless you're going to see a jazz trio or, uh, you know, virtuoso bass player, uh, you know, someone that you're going for their musicianship, not a single person in the audience cares. They don't care that they hear pad sounds and key sounds that aren't on stage. They go, man, this sounds just like the record. These people are, this vocalist is insane live. They're so good. This band is so tight together. And the emotions I feel right now, they're not opening their eyes and going, wait, where are those keys and pad sounds coming from? Normies just don't think about that. They don't care. I think sometimes we we care too much about ourselves and we have ideals too, too high where we think. And again, it's all context. If your context is you're playing jazz standards, then then please don't have sounds that aren't, I, unless it's like a new form of jazz standards. I don't want to rehash what we talked about last week. But again, if you're a three-piece drummer, bass, guitarist, then throw some pads in. Fill in for missing musicians. Uh, in that case, it's a musician that wouldn't be there in the first place. But in the other case, again, is uh, I know a lot of churches do this, that uh, a musician calls out on Saturday night, so Sunday rolls around. And they just unmute that part in the stems and they roll with it. Um, it's not ideal. It's not perfect. But it means you don't have to cancel everything because one person was out. Um, th that's a great kind of scenario. Now, it gets awkward when like, the drummer calls out and he got a band like rocking out to no drums. That, that to me, I draw a line there. That's a little weird for me. You know, Let me know in the comments if you're like, um, that that's too far for me or we've done that and it works again. I tell a story often, I typically in the context of like a church thing, but, um, we were in Brazil for a, a, a worship conference thing. Um, I don't know how many years ago, this was five, six years ago. Now I was living in Florida and, uh, we went to this conference and a full band opened up and then we were leading worship and it was me on guitar with tracks, um, uh, someone playing acoustic, someone playing keys and, uh, two, or one female vocalist, I think, if I remember now correctly. I think that's right. Uh, no, two female vocalists. That's right. Two female vocalists, one male vocalist, piano, guitar. We had no bass. We had no drums. All that was in the tracks. I felt like a complete fraud, but guess what happened? We stepped on stage, press play, and not a single person cared. I think for musicians, we're like, oh, there's no drums. There's no whatever. But again, no one cared in that moment. I think people care far less uh, and will notice far less than you really think. Again, for me, the line when you don't have a drummer and you're playing to full drum tracks, it's uh, maybe crosses a line for me. But again, I've done it and it's been effective and people don't care. Okay. So why should you use tracks? Number one, supplement your sound. We talked about adding new sounds. Number two, fill in for missing musicians. Number three, um, uh, to be bigger than yourself. What I mean by that is if you think about going to a show and a typical show, the music is just one part of it. Typically, it's a big production. In fact, um, when I did the original version of Behind the Space Bar podcast, um, uh, my buddy Eric Morris, um, he he talked about this idea of um, 
uh, the, the, like this being bigger than ourselves, this being like a Broadway production, you're competing with these shows in LA, these giant shows, you're competing with, um, uh, uh, the, the, these, you know, big giant productions that have tons and tons of elements. And you're just this, this tiny little band that's playing clubs. Well, how can you compete, compete with that? The way you compete with that is tracks, right? You, uh, have tracks that have sounds that, um, uh, that, uh, you don't have like in your band. Um, and you sound bigger than yourself. You're bigger than yourself by using click, using tracks and automating your production elements. Um, having your lights be in sync, your videos be in sync. Um, uh, again, it's bigger than you. Uh, an example I often think of my buddy, uh, Adam, um, uh, Tico, who is music director, guitar player for Lauren Elena. Um, we were uh, kind of going back and forth. I was helping him with the Ableton set thing he had, and he sent me a set. And what was awesome about the content that, that Adam had in his set was it just reminded me of one of the reasons to use tracks is to add emotion. And again, I'm going to keep that as like a sub point under point three, which is be bigger than yourself, because he had taken parts of a song where maybe there's like a big drop and, and instead of just playing straight through and just dropping what they had in the tracks was there was like a cymbal swell and there was a big filter sweep into that moment. Then at the drop, there was like an 808 kick that hit. There was a sub bass thing. There were all these things that were meant to be felt, not seen. They were meant to be experienced, not noticed, if that makes sense, to add to the emotion of the song, to make this ballad feel bigger than it is. Um, I think sometimes we forget that with tracks, particularly, again, I sometimes I get into these ruts where I like want to pick on worship leaders, but particularly in like a church worship leader context, because you go by your song at Loop Cooney, you go by your song at Multitracks, it's the original parts, uh, and you think this is what I just, I press play and I play with uh, the song and we're good. But think about it from a music director standpoint, a mu musician standpoint. Think about it from the audience perspective. Um, if you're in a church context, think about it from a congregation perspective of what's the end experience for them? What's the end user experience? And if you could take a song that's just kind of here, but you can add these transition elements that that build to a big drop or in the drop that kind of take us you know, to a different level and then bring things back, um, we can use tracks in a way like that to be bigger than ourselves. So filter sweeps, effects things, uh, voiceovers. If you have a song where in the middle, um, you know, I've heard people, this is like the kind of, uh, uh, not typical thing, but like you have a song that has a certain theme and you play a speech from someone, a famous speech from a politician or, um, uh, uh, someone that's talking about a certain topic or whatever. Um, uh, someone that's known when you think about this thing, I, if, to me, it feels kind of like the U2 thing. Like if I think of U2 playing a giant stadium tour in the middle of a song, they're going to have this part where they play a video clip. It doesn't even have to be a video clip, but it could be a video clip or it's just a voiceover of someone speaking and like the bridge of this that drives the, the point home. That's being bigger than yourself. That's not just playing music. That's thinking of an entire experience. And again, you might listen to this and go, I have no desire to do that. I just want to play music. Then great, do that. But again, I think if you're in the if you're in the goal of like, I want to serve the people that are in the audience well and I want to do what's best for them. I want to create the best experience for them. This is a great way to do that. So again, I promise this would be a shorter episode. I'm going longer than I initially intended. Um, but reasons you should use tracks, just three that came to mind for me, supplementing your sounds adding new sounds. Think of Ableton as an instrument. What are the parts that that instrument can play that can supplement your band, that can add to your band? Not with the goal of being full. Who cares if your band is full or not? That's not a goal, uh, but it's to add new sounds to your band. Uh, number two is to fill in for missing musicians or or to add parts that, that wouldn't be there. You don't have the budget to hire this person. You don't have a keys player in your band. You can have key sounds in your band. And then number three, the goal of being bigger than yourself for creating an experience, something more than just the music. We can use tracks to, to add some emotional elements. We can use tracks and click to, to automate production things and create something that's bigger than ourselves. Now, if you're just getting started with this, even if you've been using tracks for a while and you're going, uh, I'm super into this, um, but I need some help. I need some resources to help me. Uh, figure this thing out, then I want to encourage you to go to from studio to stage.com slash free 
Uh, when you go there, you're going to see every free resource I have available, including free tutorials that I release every single day, but um, free downloads and resources. You can use everything from free click tracks to time code files that will help you automate uh, stuff. No matter what context you're using this, this in, there's, those resources are there for you and are going to work in your context. Um, and here's the thing. All of those are completely free. Uh, if you were to buy them, they would cost you hundreds of dollars. And in fact, um, all of them were created from products that I sell that when you add those up cost hundreds of dollars, but they're completely free to you. So if you're interested in using tracks, if you've used tracks before, but you need a little more freedom and flexibility, you need to control things with time code, you want some better click sounds, you want a tracks template to work with, um, then head to from studio to stage.com slash free to get those. Uh, and then finally, I would love to see you back next week here on behind the space bar podcast. Or um, if you want to dive deeper into this content, you want to kind of be helped along the way, I post a new tutorial, new piece of content or podcast every single day, 10 a.m. Central. Best way to see that is just subscribe to this channel and then two, hit the bell icon so you're notified when I post new content every single day. And if you happen to be watching live, you can join in in the conversation with folks all across the world that are watching live at the same time as you. So thanks again for watching. Again, as a reminder, think of one person. Who's one person you, you, you think would enjoy this? Shoot them a text, share this with them. Um, that would be awesome. We'll see you next week, 10 a.m. Central. Take care, everybody. Bye.